I just want to quickly say if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. Thank you. Toba Supervolcanic Eruption Around 74,000 years ago, the Toba volcano, located in present-day Indonesia, erupted with an enormous force. This eruption is known as a supervolcanic event, one of the largest volcanic explosions in the last million years. Scientists estimate that it expelled roughly 2,800 cubic kilometers of volcanic material into the atmosphere, which is thousands of times larger than a typical volcanic eruption. The eruption released massive amounts of volcanic ash and sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, creating a thick cloud that spread worldwide. This cloud blocked sunlight, causing a volcanic winter that drastically lowered global temperatures for several years. Estimates suggest that the Earth's temperature dropped by as much as 3 to 5 degrees Celsius during this period, leading to significant climatic changes. This rapid cooling disrupted ecosystems across the globe, severely affecting plants, animals, and early human populations. The reduction in sunlight hindered photosynthesis, collapsing food chains starting from the smallest plants up to the largest predators. Many animal species face population declines or extinction as a result. Genetic studies of modern humans indicate that this event caused a population bottleneck. During and shortly after the eruption, the effective human population may have dwindled to as few as 3,000 to 10,000 breeding individuals. This suggests that all humans today are likely descended from this small group that survived the catastrophe. Such a low population would have made human survival precarious. Famine, harsh climate, and reduced biodiversity would have created enormous challenges. Archaeological evidence also supports a sharp decline in human activity in some regions during this time. Despite these extreme conditions, human populations endured, adapted, and eventually rebounded over the following millennia. The Toba eruption remains a key event in understanding human evolutionary history, climate impact, and the resilience of early humans in the face of near extinction. The 536 AD Climate Catastrophe in 536 AD, historical records describe a sudden and severe climate event where a mysterious dust or smoke cloud covered the sun, dimming sunlight for over a year. This caused temperatures to drop significantly across the northern hemisphere. Modern scientific studies associate this phenomenon with one or more massive volcanic eruptions or a comet impact that released huge amounts of ash and sulfur gases into the atmosphere. These particles blocked sunlight, triggering a severe volcanic winter. Tree ring data from Europe and Asia show notably reduced growth during this decade, confirming the global cooling. This cooling led to crop failures, widespread famine, and social instability in many regions. Accounts from historians of the time report cold summers, failing harvests, and food shortages across Europe, the Middle East, and parts of Asia. These conditions contributed to political turmoil and migration as populations struggled to survive. The event marked the beginning of a decade-long period of harsh climate known as the Late Antique Little Ice Age. During this time, famines were common, and societies experienced declines in economic production and urban populations. Following the climate disaster, the plague of Justinian struck in 541 AD, killing millions and further weakening societies already burdened by famine and conflict. The combination of these catastrophes contributed to significant changes across several empires, including the Byzantine and Sasanian empires. The 536 AD event is documented in various historical sources, including Byzantine chronicles, Irish annals, and Chinese records. Physical evidence from ice cores and sediment layers supports the timing and scale of atmospheric disturbance. This period marks one of the most extreme climate disruptions recorded in the last several thousand years affecting millions of people across continents. Worm glaciation. The worm glaciation, also known as the last ice age, occurred from roughly 115,000 to 11,700 years ago and was the most recent major glacial period. It primarily affected large parts of Europe, North America, and Asia, covering about 30% of Earth's landmass in ice. The glaciers were thick, extending down from mountain ranges and covering entire regions. In Europe, the Alpine region saw glaciers advancing far beyond their present-day extent. During this period, the global climate was significantly colder than today. Average temperatures dropped by several degrees Celsius, and vast ice sheets severely limited habitable and arable land. Sea levels lowered dramatically, exposing land bridges like the Bering Land Bridge between Asia and North America. These land bridges allowed human migration into new continents. 
humans faced many challenges during the Worm glaciation, including harsher weather, food scarcity, and fragmented habitats. They innovated tools such as spears, developed warmer clothing, and built more advanced shelters to improve their chances of survival. Migration patterns shifted, with many groups moving southward or into sheltered valleys. This period was essential for shaping human genetic diversity and culture. Many large mammals, including woolly mammoths, saber-toothed cats, and giant ground sloths, either went extinct or had sharply reduced populations during this time. These extinctions altered ecosystems and human hunting behaviors. Geological evidence, such as ice cores and sediment samples, allows scientists to study the timing and impact of the worm glaciation in detail. Pollen analysis provides insights into vegetation changes, while archaeological sites reveal human adaptation strategies. The worm glaciation ended around 11,700 years ago with the beginning of the Holocene epoch, leading to a gradual warming that continues today. The Black Death the Black Death was one of the deadliest pandemics in human history, caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis. It first arrived in Europe in 1347, likely carried by fleas living on rats aboard merchant ships traveling from Asia. Over four years, the plague spread rapidly across Europe. Symptoms included fever, chills, vomiting, and painful swelling of the lymph nodes, known as buboes. The plague appeared in three forms, bubonic, septicemic, and pneumonic. The bubonic form was the most common, but all forms were often fatal within days if untreated. It is estimated that the Black Death killed between 25 to 50 percent of Europe's population, ranging from 75 to 200 million people globally, including populations in Asia and North Africa. Some cities and rural villages experienced mortality rates exceeding two-thirds of their population. This loss of life caused severe labor shortages. The disruption to agriculture and trade was unprecedented. Many farms were abandoned as peasants and laborers died or fled. Food shortages ensued in some regions, and economic activities slowed dramatically. Fear and superstition took hold, leading to widespread panic. Minority groups, especially Jewish communities, were scapegoated and faced violent persecution, fueled by deep-rooted anti-Semitism and baseless accusations that they caused or spread the plague. Entire Jewish communities were destroyed in many European regions, the pandemic significantly shifted European society. Labor shortages resulted in improved wages and living conditions for survivors. The rigid feudal system began to weaken as serfs gained greater bargaining power. Additionally, the Catholic Church's influence diminished, as many people questioned traditional doctrines after witnessing widespread death. The Black Death recurred in waves for centuries but never reached the catastrophic levels of the initial outbreak. Modern research traces the plague's origin to rodent populations in Central Asia, spreading through trade routes into Europe and beyond. Stanislav Petrov Incident On September 26, 1983, Stanislav Petrov, a lieutenant colonel in the Soviet Air Defense Forces, was monitoring the Soviet Union's early warning satellite system known as OKO. The system was designed to detect incoming intercontinental ballistic missiles from the United States. At around midnight, the system alarmed, signaling that one U.S. missile had been launched toward the Soviet Union. According to Soviet military protocol, this detection required immediate confirmation and would likely lead to a retaliatory nuclear strike. Petrov doubted the alert because a first-strike nuclear attack would involve hundreds of missiles, not just one. The reliability of the new satellite system was questionable, and the ground radar could not verify the missile launch as it was beyond the horizon. Minutes later, the system detected additional missiles, totaling five, indicating an escalation. Despite pressure to report these warnings as real attacks, Petrov concluded the alerts were false and did not notify his superiors, deciding to wait and see what would happen. It was later determined that the false alarms were caused by a rare alignment of sunlight on high-altitude clouds, which the satellites misinterpreted as missile launches. Petrov's decision to classify the alert as a false alarm prevented a likely retaliatory nuclear strike by the Soviet Union, which could have triggered full-scale nuclear war. After the incident, Petrov was questioned by superiors. Although initially praised by some commanders, the incident exposed flaws in the Soviet missile detection system. Petrov was neither formally rewarded nor publicly recognized for many years. He faced disciplinary warnings for not properly filing reports. This incident occurred during a tense phase of the Cold War just weeks after the Soviet downing of Korean Airlines Flight 007 and amid heightened mistrust between the superpowers. 
the OCO satellite system was still new and had reliability issues that the incident exposed. Cuban Missile Crisis The Cuban Missile Crisis lasted 13 days in October 1962 and was the closest the world ever came to nuclear war during the Cold War era. It began when American U-2 reconnaissance planes discovered Soviet ballistic missile installations being constructed in Cuba. These missiles, capable of carrying nuclear warheads, were stationed just 90 miles from Florida, posing a direct threat to the United States. President John F. Kennedy was informed of the discovery on October 16, 1962. He immediately convened the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, known as XCOM, to evaluate options. These included a full airstrike on the missile sites, a naval blockade to prevent further Soviet shipments, or diplomatic negotiations. After intense deliberation, Kennedy decided against immediate military action. Instead, he announced a naval quarantine around Cuba on October 22nd, aiming to stop more Soviet missiles from arriving without declaring a state of war. This naval blockade was supported by the Organization of American States and was enforced by the U.S. Navy. Meanwhile, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev initially refused to remove the missiles. As tensions escalated, the U.S. military preparedness increased, with the Strategic Air Command raised to DEFCON 2, the highest ever peacetime alert. American bombers were placed on continuous airborne alert, ready to strike if needed. During the crisis, diplomatic channels remained open. Behind-the-scenes negotiations led to a resolution. Khrushchev agreed to dismantle the missile sites in Cuba, while the U.S. secretly agreed to withdraw its Jupiter missiles from Turkey. Both parties pledged not to invade the other's territory. The crisis ended on October 28, 1962, when Soviet missiles were removed from Cuba. The U.S. maintained the naval blockade until November 20. This confrontation revealed the dangers of nuclear brinkmanship and led to improved communication between the superpowers, including the establishment of the Moscow-Washington hotline. Carrington Event The Carrington Event, occurring on September 1 to 2, 1859, is the most intense geomagnetic storm ever recorded. It was caused by a massive coronal mass ejection from the sun, which surged toward Earth and collided with its magnetosphere. The CME traveled remarkably fast, taking about 17.6 hours to cross the 93 million miles from the sun to Earth, much quicker than usual. This event began with a bright solar flare observed independently by British astronomers Richard Carrington and Richard Hodgson. Carrington recorded the first documented solar flare, noting an intense white light flash on the surface of the sun. About 17 hours after the flare, Earth was struck by the CME. The geomagnetic storm generated auroras seen worldwide, even at tropical latitudes such as the Caribbean and Hawaii. In places like the Rocky Mountains, gold miners reportedly awoke at 1 a.m., mistaking the bright auroras for dawn. People in the northeastern United States could read newspapers by the light of the auroral glow. The storm severely disrupted telegraph systems, the era's critical communication technology. Telegraph operators experienced electric shocks, systems sparked, and some telegraph stations caught fire. In many cases, operators continued sending messages without external power, relying solely on the geomagnetically induced currents generated by the storm. Magnetometers recorded large fluctuations in Earth's magnetic field, often pegging off scale. The storm's power and reach impacted telegraph lines across Europe and North America for several hours. The Carrington event produced powerful electrical currents that sparked fires and caused failures in telegraph systems globally. Its auroras were visible worldwide, including at unusually low latitudes such as the Caribbean. Telegraph operators witnessed electrical shocks, and some telegraph lines operated without external power because of currents induced by the storm. Magnetometer readings showed extreme fluctuations during the event, confirming the strength of the geomagnetic storm. Chernobyl Disaster On April 26, 1986, Reactor Unit 4 at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine experienced a catastrophic power surge during a safety test. Operators had disabled critical safety systems and were attempting to measure how long turbines would spin and supply power to the main water pumps if external electricity failed. At 1.23 a.m., the reactor became unstable. Due to flawed design and operational errors, the insertion of control rods caused a rapid power spike. This led to a steam explosion that destroyed the reactor core and blew off the reactor's 1,000-ton steel and concrete lid. A second explosion, likely caused by hydrogen accumulation, released massive amounts of radioactive material into the atmosphere. 
Firefighters responded, but many suffered acute radiation sickness from intense exposure. They attempted to extinguish the fires using helicopters that dropped sand, clay, boron, and lead to contain radioactive emissions. The nearby city of Pripyat, home to plant workers, was not evacuated until about 36 hours after the explosion. Eventually, about 115,000 people were evacuated from the most contaminated zones, with total relocations reaching more than 300,000 over time. The disaster released around 5% of the reactor's radioactive material into the environment, contaminating large regions of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, as well as parts of Europe. Emergency cleanup involved hundreds of thousands of workers known as liquidators who faced high radiation doses. Sixteen immediate deaths were attributed directly to the explosion and acute radiation exposure. Longer-term health effects, including cancer risks, have been studied extensively with mixed conclusions. The destroyed reactor Unit 4 was encased in a concrete sarcophagus to limit further radiation leakage, which has since been replaced by a larger steel confinement structure.